Mr. Peter Siarto, uh, Foreign Minister of Hungary, thank you again for taking your time and accept our interview. Uh, for today, we would like to start with the Hungary-China relationship because we know China is a very important uh, trade partner with Hungary, and Hungary is also a very vital uh, trade partner with China, especially in Central and Mis uh, Eastern Europe. So for you, what do you think of the current um, relationship between Hungary and China? Look, we have just um, started a new uh, success story. We have been negotiating for um, around two years uh, with the uh, market leader company of the uh, uh, global industry of manufacturing electric batteries, namely CATL. And uh, these negotiations uh, have uh, turned out to be successful at the end, thanks God. So uh, we have just announced and celebrated the biggest ever investment in the history of Hungary, which is a 7.4 billion euro investment on behalf of CATL to uh, build a new huge uh, factory to produce electric batteries, which is uh, going to be the biggest such kind of an investment in Europe ever. And it is among the five biggest investments in the last 10 years in Europe, generally speaking. So we have opened a new chapter of the uh, book, which is written about the success story about the cooperation between the People's Republic of China and uh, Hungary. We are uh, grateful uh, for this decision since it will create uh, jobs for multiple tens of thousands of people, putting into consideration all the supplier and service uh, industry. This puts Hungary in an even more important uh, position when it comes to this uh, new age of automotive industry, namely the electromobility uh, period. And uh, that will attract further investment uh, to Hungary as well. The, um, the three uh, largest premium car makers of Germany uh, do already have or have been constructing uh, manufacturing sites. And Hungary, uh, this puts China, Germany, and Hungary in a unique position that these are the only three countries where these three premium car making companies have separate factories. And they all put um, a significant part of their electromobility strategies to, uh, to Hungary, thanks to this investment. So uh, this is now a new age, and even more successful than so far. And, uh, and I think that, that, that proves that, uh, that our cooperation so far has been successful, and it made sense to put so much effort into a relationship to be built based on, uh, on mutual respect. So I just want to ask, since you have already mentioned the ATL, what is the magic or the attraction there for Hungary to, uh, to attract all those foreign capitals to invest? Look, I might uh, mention four reasons. Uh, first, we have the most stable uh, political system of Europe. Uh, the government uh, has won, the government party has won four continuous elections all of them with a two-third majority. Our prime minister has been the longest serving one in, in Europe. Uh, so this table system allows us to deliver uh, our, what we promise. So whatever we agree upon with the investors, it's easy to, um, uh, to fulfill. The second is the fact that uh, we have never discriminated uh, among investors based on uh, nationality. So even, when, um, even in, during times of uh, huge pressure on us, uh, you know, to, um, to kind of forbid or limit uh, the presence of Chinese uh, investors and companies in Hungary, we have always rejected that pressure because we, uh, we have had so far a very uh, respectful cooperation with the Chinese investors. They have always brought state-of-the-art technology to Hungary. Uh, they have created jobs. They turned out to be reliable partners. I mean, why should we reject Chinese investors just because being Chinese? So, in Hungary, we have only one expectation towards the companies, regardless of what kind of nationality they are. And this expectation is that they have to uh, respect our laws and regulations, period. Uh, third, uh, is, third aspect is that um, the lowest tax rates are being applied in Hungary in European terms. So uh, um, the uh, corporate income tax rate is only 9%. The personal income tax rate is only 15%. Both of them are flat. So um, that helps the bookkeepers to uh, put together good uh, business plans. And the fourth one uh, is uh, the human resources, uh, no question. Our uh, education system uh, has been reformed during the last 12 years in a way that the vocational um, training uh, has been uh, strengthened. The universities are now 
um, acting according to higher and higher uh, standards of, uh, of, uh, of level of education. So these four factors, I think, in one basket uh, creates uh, the most uh, attractive uh, investment environment in Europe uh, for Hungary. We, we know that uh, Hungary is also a country that participated in uh, Belt and Road Initiative. What role uh, Belt and Road Initiative played in the development of Hungary and what can the experience of Hungary-China cooperation uh, show the global community? Look, I have to tell you that I'm personally proud that uh, I was the first European foreign minister to sign uh, the cooperation uh, agreement uh, uh, with the People's Republic on, of China on the One Belt, One Road initiative with uh, my colleague and my dear friend, Foreign Minister and State Councillor Wang Yi back in the summer 2015, so a long time ago, more than uh, seven years. Uh, and uh, we have took a lot of benefit and a lot of profit uh, out of the, uh, uh, out of the uh, Belt and Road uh, initiative because, <coughs> you know, we do believe in East to West cooperation. And we do believe that uh, if, there's a, um, if there's a successful and pragmatic a, um, cooperation between East and West based on mutual benefits and mutual respect, <laughs> then uh, peace uh, is going to be easier to, to be achieved, you know. And, uh, and that's why this kind of economic and infrastructure uh, related uh, cooperations are extremely important uh, for us. We would like to be a transit route. Uh, for the goods being delivered from China to the western part of Europe. That's why uh, we have started to uh, build a new uh, railway line between Belgrade and Budapest with Chinese uh, uh, loan in the framework of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, because with this uh, we will serve as the quickest uh, and the most um, um, attractive uh, transit route for Chinese goods shipped into the Greek ports uh, and then uh, to be delivered to the, to the western part of, uh, of Europe. So, um, for us, uh, for us, the Belt and Road Initiative means economic and trade cooperation and infrastructural development as well. Now, uh, Minister, when we first met here in New York, we talked about, we actually focused on Ukraine crisis. And the second time, we also talk about Ukraine crisis. And now, more than 200 days, yeah. I'm afraid we're still going to talk about this. Because as, a, as, as, as far as I know, the Hungary announced twice about state emergency. Once in May, that's the state emergency, and once in July, that would be the state of emergency in energy. Uh, all concern, both are concerning about the Ukrainian crisis. So, so how, how's, how's the, the, the uh, Ukrainian crisis now impacted, uh, impact the, uh, Hungary? Look, we are a neighboring country to Ukraine. And I don't think I have to uh, explain it too long that uh, if uh, there's a war in a neighboring country, uh, then it has a serious impact uh, on you in uh, four ways at least. First, uh, it's a burden on you uh, regarding the refugees. One and a half million Ukrainian refugees have already uh, entered uh, Hungary. And of course, we, uh, we give them um, um, all assistance we can. For those who stay, we offer jobs and we made a clear regulation that uh, uh, access to education and health care for the refugees is equal uh, to the uh, similar rights of the Hungarian citizens. So we give everything for them. Uh, second, uh, in terms of energy. You know, um, we are dependent on Russian gas and oil, uh, and since the prices are skyrocketing, uh, we have to pay, pay a multiple, multiple amount of money uh, for both uh, energy uh, sources. Third, on inflation. I mean, inflation is skyrocketing again, close to around 50%, 15, uh, one five, uh, percent. Uh, and then uh, the commodity prices, uh, mostly food. So, you know, all these uh, put a tremendous challenge uh, on us. We are fighting against those. So uh, we have introduced uh, price caps uh, on fuel, on the basic food, on the mortgage loans, uh, in, in order to, uh, to keep at least the prices of these under uh, control. And there's a cap on the uh, utility cost uh, as well. But it, I mean, it requires a lot of effort, a lot of, um, lot of money <laughs> and a lot of energy uh, from us. But I mean, for those who are further away from Ukraine, uh, 
I understand it's difficult to explain to what extent we are suffering from this conflict. So uh, recently, foreign policy just said, and I quote, the biggest U.S. arms package yet is a sign that policymakers think the war isn't ending anytime soon. And the United States starts to play the long game in Ukraine. Do you think this will be a long game? And can, you, can Europe uh, bear a long game? Look, um, to be honest, currently I don't see um, the end of the war coming soon, unfortunately. We always had the hope. When we first spoke, uh, that was just a couple of days after, um, after the war uh, had broken out, there we had the hope that it would end really soon. And now it's more than half a, a year. And you still don't see the end because the conflict is getting uh, deeper and deeper, sharper and sharper. And, you know, Hungary, uh, as a neighboring country, always concentrated on how we can achieve peace. <coughs> we have always called for immediate start of uh, peace talks and an immediate ceasefire. Others, others rather car carry weapons, deliver weapons to the Ukrainians. We decided not to do so because we want to stay out uh, of this uh, conflict. Uh, we don't want to be engaged uh, in these terms. And, and, if it, and if it is going to be a long game, as you said, well, I think the impacts will be devastating on Europe simply. So the European economy has uh, been in recession now, I guess. So, I mean, or at least uh, the growth is, you know, far lower and smaller what it could be. And, you know, there are forecasts for the recession. And, you know, Europe used to be a uh, leading uh, power of the world when it comes to economy, trade. Uh, and now this is absolutely, this has absolutely not been the case. And I understand that some actors in the globe are winning on this situation, of course, because if Europe loses, then someone else should win. And, uh, and you know, the sanctions uh, which have been in place on behalf of the European Union seem to hurt us much more than the Russians. But whenever you raise this question and try to, um, try to put the whole context on a um, rational basis, you are immediately being judged and attacked as if you know you would be a Russian ally, spy of that, Putin. That's what I'm stuff. going to yeah. ask next. Yeah. Uh, because on the energy, um, Hungary just signed a gas deal, a yeah. gas supply deal with Russia in late August. Yeah. What's the consideration behind this deal, given the fact that you have already facing, you have been already facing mounting pressures from European countries? Look. Um, Gas supply is, uh, is not a political issue. Gas supply is a core physical issue because you need a gas source and you need pipeline. Otherwise, it's just a myth. Otherwise, it's just, just a fairy tale. I mean, you know, uh, with ideology or with, uh, with political statements, you cannot heat your house, you cannot cook, you, you cannot have uh, hot water in the tub, you know? So, I mean, it, it's a physical one. And uh, if you look at the um, energy infrastructure map of Central Europe, you see uh, that uh, the, uh, the pipelines are, uh, have been built in a way that we can only buy um, a big amount of gas from the Russians. That's, that's a fact. That's a determination. Determination of infrastructure and determination of uh, geography. So, uh, I mean, we can have dreams to buy gas from somewhere else, but this is not a reality. And with dreams, you cannot hit. So, um, so that's why uh, we, uh, we signed the deal last year with Russia for a long-term contract. And this year, we have amended that uh, uh, contract uh, with additional volumes of gas because we simply need them. I mean, uh, currently, the, um, the level of fillingness of our gas storage is 40% compared to consumption. Compared to consumption. Wow. We should be enough. I mean, the, no, no, under normal circumstances, that's more than enough. But mm -hmm. we are not living under normal circumstances, so we need more gas. Because what we definitely want to avoid is that uh, Hungarian people, households, or, or, or enterprises get into a humiliating situation that, that uh, usage of gas should be limited. We just simply don't want to see such situation. I understand in the Western part of Europe that became kind of politically acceptable, but in Hungary it's not. So you warned the Western European countries, as you said, and I quote, I ideological political communication statements with effective support from the international media can easily inflate balloons that cover people's eyes and you said that winter policy of the EU won't work it seems to me Hungary is taking a more practical approach on this issue why is that look um, 
I hear the um, success reports of the Western European colleagues uh, saying that uh, you know the level of fillingness of the storage capacities in Europe are like 80, 90, 100, 110, whatever percent, you know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's <laughs> I should not use the word what just came to my mind. So it's it's not true. Let's put it this way, mm -hmm. because uh, I mean, practic I mean, physically it's true, but but I mean, comparing the level of fillingness to the storage capacity itself simply doesn't make sense because you don't store your gas to be stored. You store your gas in order to cover the consumption. So what you have to what you have to be aware is what extent what percentage uh, of the annual consumption your gas, which is being stored in your warehouses, can cover? That's the question. And I told you in Hungary it's 40 percent, but in Europe it's 23. So those success reports, we say that 80, 90, 100 percent um, of the gas storage are full, that means that 22 percent of the annual European consumption can be covered by that, 22 percent. In case of Hungary, it's 40, mm -hmm. uh, because we go the practical way. We don't we don't want to make people blind. We don't want to um, you know um, um, create a context which is like a balloon, because at the end of the day, truth will come, and then king will be naked. And uh, uh, and you know if 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 it's cold and if there's no heating, you you can't tell the people that there is heating if there's no heating. You know. But but you know the European Parliament has already said that Hungary can no longer be considered as a full democracy because of this approach. Yeah, but that's a joke. I mean, uh, European Parliament itself is a joke, to be honest, because I mean, nowadays, when Europe has been faced with tremendous um, uh, crisis of, uh, of prices, of uh, inflation, or, of energy, what's the most important duty of the European Parliament? To judge Hungary, a country uh, where democratic elections are taking place. The fact is that the that the left side of the European Parliament hates the fact that the Hungarian people are mature enough to decide about their own future. And they hate the fact that a conservative, center-right, Christian democratic, patriotic government of Hungary has been successful for more than 13 years, has been winning four continuous elections, and is still successful, uh, and it can satisfy the needs of the people. They hate this fact. And you know, when they speak about democracy, the question is what they mean under the term democracy. Because under democracy, we mean that the will of the people is being fulfilled. What they mean under democracy? They mean that the liberal parties are ruling the country. I mean, no, it's not liberal countries ruling the country, but it's a democracy. So, so we, we have a different uh, understanding about democracy uh, uh, with them. And they, they basically insult the Hungarian people on a continuous basis instead of dealing with how to improve the situation in Europe. Uh, let's talk about the future cooperation with China. We know that the 20th uh, National Congress of the Communist Party of China will be uh, held in Beijing in o October. Uh, after the Congress, what do you, what's your expectation for the future uh, Hungary and China cooperation? Well, uh, I've been dealing with uh, this uh, issue for more than 10 years now. And I have collected a very positive experience, a lot. And I do hope that uh, after the, the Congress, regardless of what would be the outcome, and we don't want to interfere and don't want to judge, don't want to comment, because it's a Chinese domestic mm -hmm. and internal issue. Uh, I hope that the cooperation uh, will be continued in a similar smooth and uh, um, respectful way, as it has been the case so far. So the Chinese President Xi Jinping also proposed the concept, I think, in 2015 of a community with a shared future for mankind. Um, given the fact we have discussed today, or, or actually today, do you agree that we are indeed in a, in a shared, there's a shared future for mankind and we need to preserve that future? Well, there's, a, there's definitely a need for such kind of an initiative because now there are so many conflicts in the world, be them political or armed, that is getting too much. And my generation had always the illusion that we would never have to uh, experience uh, war circumstances, and now there's a war in our neighborhood. And uh, isolation is uh, taking place in international politics. There are actors who are not ready to talk to each other. They are hostile relationships. Uh, there are uh, wars and armed conflict conflicts popping up in different parts of the world. Uh, this should be stopped. This should be stopped. And, and, and we should understand that we are sharing the same planet and we shouldn't destroy that. And we shouldn't destroy the lives uh, of each other. I mean, uh, 
uh, these wars which uh, are taking place now are endangering the um, the future of the of the current young people and and this is something that we cannot accept so there's a need for such an initiative to <laughs> to understand that we share the same planet so how to promote unity and for a you know better and stronger future uh, look I, I think if you look at the um, if you look at the international politics now the phenomenon which we miss the most is mutual respect so uh, as long as mutual respect is not returning to international politics, uh, we can't uh, count on improvement. Why? Because as long as uh, there are countries and people and institutions who think that they should interfere into domestic issues of others, and as long as they think that they know better what the others need, uh, then, then this bad situation is going to prevail. And uh, that's why I think that uh, mutual respect um, uh, should come back and, and, and we should leave it to the certain nations what they want to do about their own future how they want to accommodate their own lives and we should not look smarter than them themselves you know uh, how they should live so um, after the pandemic if you got a chance another chance to visit China which place do you think you want to visit and why is that? Well, uh, wherever I can meet uh, State Councillor Wang Yi, no question. So uh, if he invites me, I would be happy to come uh, again. I'm happy to meet him this week here in, in New York. Uh, I hope we will have a good chat and I hope that it's going to be fruitful. And uh, whenever, it, whenever it is uh, becoming possible again to, uh, to come to China, I'll be happy. And of course, to receive uh, my dear friend, uh, the State Councillor in Hungary would also give us an honor. I would, I would like to suggest my hometown, Chongqing. All right, that, that, I can take it, no problem. That's just a joke. Okay, so um, Peter Sierto, Foreign Minister of Hungary, thank you very much for your time. Thank I you. I appreciate the possibility, thank you.